It all began with a game, or so the legend says. In ages past, an RPG, enormous and beautiful, banished the boredom. Its many-colored light filled the world with life and brought forth many players. Bathed in that light, the world entered an age of bliss, until, after a time, the players fell into slumber. That world was called Vanadil. Final Fantasy XI has evolved a lot over the past decade and a half, and it's easy to lament the changes. The experience of Vanadil simply isn't the experience you would have had 15 years ago. However, not all these changes were bad. In fact, the quality of life has improved substantially since then. From the increased experience gain rate, the ability to keep track of the game's dozens of currencies, skill up items, equipment sets, wide scan to find NPCs. Final Fantasy XI has a lot of great things that makes the game more modern while still keeping the feel of the original game. Even the trust system I mentioned in my original video still attempts to mimic the traditional party, especially if you consider the fact that years prior it was about chest farming or book burning. However, one of the best quality of life changes in Final Fantasy XI was how you travel. Vanadil is a huge world. This was the first game that required the PlayStation 2's hard disk drive in order to even play it. And a good portion of that was just how vast and varied the different areas in Eleven's world was. For example, traveling from one of the starting nations to Juno, something that all adventurers eventually made, required a trip on foot that took over half an hour. When you got your chocobo license, which could have been weeks after you first started playing, you could make that trip in half the time. The day you got your airship pass was one to celebrate because now that trip only took you 7 minutes, not including the wait time for the airship. That's just one example of a common trip you would make possibly hundreds of times in a playthrough. Nowadays that's a thing of the past. You can travel to nearly anywhere in an instant using the game's various home points or survival guides. It was quite possibly one of the most welcome changes to Final Fantasy XI. Add that with the warp ring that made return trips nearly instant, the mountain system, and outright increasing the movement speed of characters. Traveling now is almost a formality. It made some of the missions that required you to spend hours just traveling place to place take only a couple of minutes. However, sometimes it's not about the destination, but the journey. Don't get me wrong, I would not trade the convenience of a one minute trip to Norg for anything. But you can't make a change without losing something in the process. One of the things I think was very important to the experience of Final Fantasy XI was exploring the world of Vanadil. Spending hours of traveling might have been a begrudging experience, but the result was being familiar to hundreds of locales that you might not otherwise pay attention to if you weren't forced to navigate it. And over the years, these areas have become what I associate with Final Fantasy XI. So I think it's time we explored these distant worlds together. Let's take a walk through Vanadil. This is Building Character Distant Worlds, an in-depth look at some of the greatest moments of world building and gaming. And I wanted to start this series by talking about one of my favorite areas in Final Fantasy XI. It's not the most beautiful, it doesn't have the best narrative, it is an example of genius level design, and it's even a little divisive. 
but for me, it's a perfect example of what makes Final Fantasy XI's world building so wonderful. Let me tell you about Gustaberg. Gustaberg, or more accurately North and South Gustaberg, is the region right outside of Bastok, one of the game's starting nations. For the most part, the land is completely devoid of life. The sparse remains of dead trees decorate the nearly desiccated landscape. Vultures hover in the sky as worms eat at the corpse of the earth. What little green that exists is surrounded by vast swaths of inhospitable land. Half-built outpost abandoned for what could have been decades, and at the peaks of some of the highest mountains lie the graves and monuments of those who lost their lives forging these lands. Gustaberg is a bleak, hostile land. However, in its own way, it's extremely beautiful. The shades of yellow dawn and gradient dusk as the sun rises and sets, and the moon causing the land to glow with its pale light. The natural beauty of the Drakenfall that causes me to pause ever so slightly when I pass by it. While it's a seemingly barren land, the fact that Bastok was able to thrive in this area symbolically shows how resilient life truly is like the grass growing in spite of the death surrounding it. There are rare sights of genuine beauty. Gustaberg embodies the Japanese aesthetic known as wabi-sabi. It's difficult to really explain, but as a rather gross oversimplification of the term, it's the concept that something can be flawed, but that those imperfections are what make it beautiful. It's often represented as a chip in a cup, or the scratch or rust on a car. But it doesn't always have to be physical. It's the idea that even emotions that we often associate as negative, such as loneliness, sadness, anger, doubt, or fear, can be beautiful by its own merit. It's an understanding that life is transient and imperfect, but each scar tells its own story. In a way, Wabi Sabi is about gaining experience and building character. Hey, wait a second, I'm not done yet. Gustaberg even has one of my favorite soundtracks in the game. A hauntingly beautiful score composed by Kumi Tanioka. And just a disclaimer before we start, I'm not an expert on music theory, so anything expressed here is just my own interpretation. But this song matches perfectly with Gustaberg. The song starts with a long, singular violin note. It creates this sense of uncertainty and anxiety of stepping into the unknown. Something that was used with Final Fantasy VII's opening theme. That note is eventually joined by a melody of an xylophone. A slight echo conveying a sense of desolation and loneliness that lasts until it's finally accompanied by the sound of a wind instrument. Fitting that metal and wind being the most predominant elements in Gustaberg. As the song continues, it progressively adds more melodies and instruments, and transforms into this combination of beautiful sounds that teem with life and purpose, working together to create an emotional song. It's ephemeral though. Eventually all the instruments part ways, 
leaving only the acoustic guitar for the breakdown. But bit by bit, each instrument returns, ending with a hopeful yet somber finish. And no, the allegory between that and the nature of Final Fantasy XI's parties and community wasn't lost on me. However, this doesn't change the fact that Gustberg is an ultimately empty, wide open space. There is very little to distract you from the waste surrounding you. And it's not just Gustberg either. Almost every zone is a large area filled with only a few landmarks that stand out. All things considered, Final Fantasy XI is filled with a lot of negative space. You could compare the zones of Final Fantasy XI more to Hyrule Field in a way. Once praised for how large it is, but it's now often seen as needlessly big for what is considered a hub world. Contrast Gustaberg to a similar area in Final Fantasy XIV, Thanalan, the starting area outside of Udom. While it shares a similar setting to Gustaberg, it's filled with landmarks, outposts, taverns, camps, ports, railroads. Nearly every section of this region has some sort of defining theme and almost nothing is wasted. There's so much more to do and see, and because of that, it makes the world seem more alive. Intuitively, it's easy to think that it's just objectively better to add as much as you can. But sometimes, less can be more. At the risk of crossing even more into Gaijin Goomba's territory, we return to Japanese aesthetics. There is a term for this, ma. It roughly translates as space or pause. It's the idea that silence can often speak louder than words. It's the same concept that a dramatic pause before the right word can make it feel more... important or a moment of quiet in a song that makes the notes come after it seem more meaningful. It's very similar to the concept of scarcity. The less of something there is, the more we value it. It's commonly attributed to economics, but it can apply pretty much to anything. In game design, you see it in everything from rewards to jump scares, but it applies just as much to world building. Nearly every zone in Final Fantasy XI is built around this sense of ma. For the cynical, you can say that it's just padding, but this empty space is often what defines the various zones. Because each of these landmarks are surrounded by what is effectively nothing, each instance of these means you pay attention to them that much more. So when you think of Gustaberg, you immediately associate it with the Dragonfall. And because some of these sites are off the beaten path, sometimes not even on the map at all, it means just that much more when you discover them. However, it also means that you can play the game and never really notice it. I totally understand if some of you are entirely nonplussed about what I'm saying. I mean, it's almost the opposite of what you expect in a video game. Most times the world building is pretty much based solely around the needs of the game. I mean, you wouldn't make a platformer and design the levels before you design the jumping physics. By the same token, if you want to include ice physics in your game, then you're going to come up with a reason to fit an ice level in your game. This is called top-down design, and it's usually one of the better ways to make a game. You ensure everything has a reason or purpose. Final Fantasy XI, by the nature of being an MMO, couldn't design everything from the top down. While I'm sure certain elements were designed around the concepts for a plot and gameplay, a lot of the quests, characters, and even enemies were most likely built around the world, or bottom-up design. You can tell because there's some areas in Final Fantasy XI that were never really used or implemented. Some serve no purpose, other than to maybe used as a placeholder for something later, or at best just serve as set pieces. And it could be argued that this isn't good game design. I mean, why not take the effort to make these landmarks or sites valuable? If there's nothing to connect these locations to, then at best it might just make these things forgettable or uninteresting. But because of the nature of the bottom-up design, 
While it doesn't give a sense of urgency to the gameplay, it makes the world as a whole more interesting. It's almost uncanny. Vanadil feels like it's set in a post-apocalyptic world. The many decaying structures that no longer hold a purpose, but rather a history. They remind us that Vanadil existed long before our characters have. It's almost as if you're exploring the ruins of another time that civilization built itself around. The idea that people are built around the world, rather than the world evolving around the needs of the story or characters, it makes Vanadil feel like a real, tangible world. And because of that, it's not only easier to get invested into the game, but also the community surrounding it. However, that's not what makes Gustaberg my favorite area in Final Fantasy XI. What I just said could have been applied to nearly every zone in the game. Almost all of them have those elements. The reason is almost entirely personal and mostly biased. It's one of my favorites because Bastok was my starting nation and Gustaberg was effectively my home. And I'm proud to be a Bastokin, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the Gaka who died, who gave that ride to me. I know, it sounds overly sentimental, but I get the same feeling walking the paths of Gustaberg as I do walking around the town I was raised in. Gustaberg to me is incredibly nostalgic. It is where my earliest memories of Final Fantasy XI reside. It's where I made my first friend. It's where I fought my first monster. It's how I got involved with my first party. I think I had spent literal days grinding against worms, bees, and crabs before I felt comfortable stepping into the highlands. It's where I remember spending hours of my life hunting Leaping Lizzie. It was a real sense of home as well. Before I had an airship pass and well before the ability to travel via the home points, Gustaberg was the start and end of nearly every expedition. On my way to level in the dunes or making my long trip to Juno, I would pass by the region of Gustaberg. Then after being away for what could have been weeks at a time, traveling to Quitham Island or Kazam or even further, the dry, arid landscape accompanied by that haunting melody gave me a sense that it was really home. When I don't see that deserted wasteland for a while, I get a real sense of homesickness. Nearly every time I renewed my subscription, I step into Gustaberg for a very brief moment. Because that's when it's real to me. Obviously, I can only speak for myself. But I'm willing to bet that feeling exists for those who might have even started in the savanna-like terrain of Saruta Baruta or the hilly forest of Ronfar. It might even be Thanalan, or even Hyrule Field. It's one of those things that is deeply personal to each person, and it probably can't be explained unless you've experienced it for yourself. Now though, it's rare seeing a person stepping into the wasteland for the first time like I did 13 years ago. Even Leaping Lizzie can exist in peace without new adventurers hunting for her prized boots. Gustaberg feels lonely and desolate. With the changes to travel, there are very little reasons to travel through Gustaberg. Or really, the majority of zones for that matter. All these areas that had once defined the world of Vanadil now run the risk of simply fading away. But as one bright star shines through the clouds at night, and one song rings clear above the roar of beast, we hold to one hope in these darkest of times. That star is you, and the song is yours. And someday, that hope will become our dreams, our prayers. Shine forth, Star of Hope. Let your song ring out across all of Vanadil. And what was split asunder will once again become whole, complete and inseparable for all eternity. That world was called Vanadil, never to be forgotten. Vanadil. Hey, 
Hey, thank you very much for watching and being patient with this video. This is the first of what I hope to be a series of videos on the various areas of Final Fantasy XI and its world building. I don't want it to be just about my favorite zones though. The community is more than just an individual. So if there's an area that holds a special place in your heart, let me know in the comments and tell me about it. It might just be featured in a future episode of Building Character. Also, if you happen to know another channel that does Final Fantasy XI content, maybe tell them about this video because this is kind of a perfect opportunity for collaborations. You could say I'm looking for a party, so please invite me. I want to give a very special thank you to all the patrons who support this channel because they are what allow me to make videos like this. Right now, Patreon is my only means of income, and that Final Fantasy XI subscription isn't cheap. So if you want to see more content like this, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Even $1 a month goes a long way, and it gives you benefits like seeing these videos early. Also, a very special thank you to Aki for her generous contribution. Also, so you don't miss the next episode, Feel free to subscribe and remember to hit that bell notification because YouTube is kind of dumb. So until next time, this is Serbador reminding you that gaining experience builds character.